like to have just an extra prayer before we start. Is that okay? I'd like to invite you to kneel as we have prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are all involved in a spiritual warfare right now, and there are a lot of things happening, and, and I really need your presence and your direction in this message. So please bless to that end, and uh, let nothing come out of my lips that you're not fully pleased with that won't honor and glorify you and edify your people. And let nothing go into their ears but that which is good and right, and help their hearts to accept it, assimilate it, and use it. And I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 11 and 12. There the Apostle Paul says, Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. The apostle tells us that we are in a conflict, as it were. We are a people at war. And we need armor. We need protection against the wiles or the strategies of Satan. Because it's not just a ministry here that we think is teaching error, or a president or a senator or someone over here that we're fighting against. We're fighting against spiritual wickedness, spiritual wickedness in higher heavenly places. On June the 6th of 1944, Operation Overlord began. Operation Overlord. This was the Normandy invasion. And it was the critical event, perhaps, of World War II. The success or failure of the Allies was hinged to a great degree upon it. We know it better as D-Day. We think of it as D-Day. But did you know that in, in the military, the expression D-Day, do you know what it stands for? Do you know what the D in D-Day stands for? It stands simply for day. Day. Interesting. D-Day is the day on which a combat attack or operation is to be initiated. In fact, many other invasions and operations have been designated D-Day, both before and after that operation. But I would like to say that today, we are living in a spiritual D-Day. And every day of our lives, is a new D-Day, a new day to begin a conflict with evil, a new day to experience spiritual warfare. It is a war that is being fought every day because the enemy never calls a ceasefire, never has a truce, is always vigilant and active. You know, you, you can talk about lazy people, but the devil's not one. He's always active, He's going about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And so, friends, we are in war. But unlike the day of Normandy, now, as you may remember in reading your history, General Eisenhower, who later became President Eisenhower, he was uh, appointed to be the supreme commander of the Allied forces. Now, he didn't go on shore. He didn't go to shore on D-Day. You know, he was back in England directing the affairs. But before the operation went into effect, he had two different letters dictated. One in case of success, and the other his resignation letter, an acceptance of responsibility for failure in case it didn't work. Because this operation had no guaranteed success. They had it planned out as best they could. They believed there was a high chance of victory, but they couldn't guarantee it. They couldn't promise it. But beloved, in our spiritual warfare, it is different. We have the known outcome ahead of us already. And it is victory. 
It is victory. It is victory and it is not uncertain. It is victory because Jesus Christ has won the victory on the cross of Calvary for us. And if we will abide in Jesus Christ, his complete victory can be our complete victory in the spiritual warfare in which we engage. Now I want to begin by looking at point one. I'm going to categorize this out for you so you'll know where we're at. But we're going to be talking here about the victories won by Jesus Christ first. Victories over sin and temptation, over the world, victory over the devil, victory over, the, over death, victory over every enemy that he encountered. And the first of these is over sin and temptation. And let us see what the scripture says about this first by turning to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. Paul says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the filling of our infirmities, but was at all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Now this phrase begins with two negative thoughts. We generally wouldn't write it like that in English, but in their time, in their language, that was just fine. But we would say it probably more clearly this way today in our language. We do have a high priest who is touched with the filling of our infirmities. You see, we do have this kind of high priest. It's not that we don't have one who knows nothing about it. In fact, we do. And it says that he was tempted in all points like us, but without sin. Now, of course, Jesus Christ wasn't tempted in every specific temptation. No one could be tempted in every specific temptation that everyone else has available to us. But in every point, in every principle that you can look at that affects the way you're tempted, he was tempted. We won't take time to turn there right now, but I'll give you as reference. You go back to Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, and there you read about the temptations of Christ in the wilderness, remember? And how did Jesus always overcome in those situations? He would say, it is written. It is written. And so his mind was full of the Word of God. And I'm sure that some of those words were taken from Psalms 119. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways by taking heed thereto according to thy word? Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. That's verses 9 and 11 of Psalms 119. And so through the word, he was able to overcome sin and temptation. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses, verse 22, it says, Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Neither was guile found in his mouth. And in the Sabbath school class that I was just teaching, we were reading from Revelation chapter 14, verse 5, where it speaks about the 144,000, that special elite troop of, of, of Christian warriors at the very end of time. And it says that one of their great characteristics is that they have no guile in their mouth. There's no deceit. And it says here that Jesus did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. And as the Apostle James says, that if you can cure the tongue, if you can tame the tongue, then you can tame the whole body. Because the tongue is a very unruly creature. It most certainly is. But Jesus overcame the temptations and the sin of the world. Everything that Satan had to throw at him, Jesus overcame it. Jesus also said that he overcame the world. You know, the Apostle John, in 1 John chapter 2, he speaks about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. All the things of the world the, that, that the world uses to allure us, to tempt us to do the wrong thing, to tempt us to go to the wrong places, to tempt us to become involved in the wrong things. In John chapter 16 and verse 33, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye may have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have what? I have overcome the world. Jesus is saying, I've got the victory over the world. I've got the victory over the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. I have the victory over all of them. And he tells us that we need not be in consternation. We can have peace. We can have peace because of the things that Jesus has done and what he has said unto us. Jesus got the victory over the devil. He got the victory over the devil. Very specifically, in John chapter 12 and verse 31. John chapter 12 and verse 31. Jesus says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world 
be cast out. Who is the prince of this world? Satan. And he shall be cast out because Jesus has gotten the victory. Now there's a text in Colossians chapter 2. I want you to look at it. It's in verse 15. Concerning this victory of Christ. And in Colossians 2.15 he says, And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a shoe or a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Now there's a couple words in this verse I'd like to draw your attention to. And the first one is spoiled. Spoiled. Usually when we think of the word spoiled, maybe a piece of rotten food comes to your mind. Maybe you've seen some old rotten food. Maybe even lately. And we think of something that was good that became not good, right? That may be what we think about. But this word spoiled, it's translated from a Greek word, apek duomai. Apek duomai. And it means to disarm. To disarm. It's like if there's an assailant in a room, maybe a, a, a shooter comes into a building and he's going to try to kill people. And someone comes up behind him and knocks the gun out of his hand. He's become disarmed. In other words, his weapon, his power has been taken from him. And that's the meaning of this word spoiled in Colossians 2.15. In other words, Christ de-armed. He took the power away from the principalities and powers and made a shoe of them openly. And this word power, powers here, is from exosia. It means authorities. Over the principalities and the authorities. Those that would have authority to do evil or those who would have the ability to do evil. Now in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14 also, we should look at this. Hebrews 2.14. Because there's a word here we want to introduce to you. Hebrews 2.14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. And again, we're talking about the fact that Christ had the power here over the devil. But we've mentioned to you before that one word that we translate power is exousia. It's also translated authority. It means delegated authority. Another word that we translate power is dunamis. And those are the two words that we usually translate as um, power. But there's a third word in Greek that we don't see so often. I think it's used ten times in the New Testament. And here it is in this verse in Hebrews 2.14 that he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. And this is the Greek word kratos. Kratos. And it means the power to rule or control. And so what it means in this sense is that it's someone who's ruling in authority. Kratos means the power to rule or control. And so Jesus destroyed him that had the power to control death. He had the power to, uh, he, he, could, he had the power to control or to destroy the one who had the power of death. And in fact, that brings us to the next point. That Jesus gained the victory and he overcame death. Only Jesus Christ, friends, can point to an empty tomb. Only Jesus Christ can point to the empty tomb. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 24, Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost said, Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Why was it impossible for death to hold Christ? Because he had never sinned. He had never sinned. And death could have no power to hold him. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, in verse 10, it says, But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Amen to that, friends? I'm just so thankful that we can have eternal life through Christ because he has overcame the grave. He has overcome death in all things. And he has overcome every enemy. Every enemy. Now we know ultimately the ultimate enemy is Satan. But he has so many allies and so many of those who work with him and, and against us and against Jesus Christ. And Jesus overcame every enemy. Now to, to some people, Muhammad Ali holds the place in boxing history 
as the greatest fighter of all time. Uh, there was a, a time in this world that he had the most recognizable face in the world. In the world. His face was more recognizable than the Pope's face. And yet, as great as he was, with his 56 professional victories, most of those knockouts, he still had five losses. The great one had five losses. Even the great one cannot win them all. But beloved, Jesus Christ has won them all. He has gained every victory over every foe. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verses 24 and 25, Paul eloquently writing, he says, Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, who is God, He's the Father, isn't he? When he shall put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all, what? Enemies. All enemies under his feet. Not just some. You know, 56 and 5 wouldn't be good enough for God. It's got to be 100%. All enemies under his feet. And that's why we can read in Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 9. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now there are people today who don't believe in God at all. You know, we have the atheists like Richard Dawkins and the author of the book, The God Delusion. But according to the text of Scripture, there will be a day, and we believe it's going to probably, be for, unfortunately for him, at the end of the millennium, that he's going to bow down and say he was wrong. And he's going to acknowledge that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. I pray he can do it before Jesus comes. Because we're all going to do it. Every one of us will do this. And we're either going to make this acknowledgement before Jesus comes, as well as after, or only after. And if we only make it after, it will be too late. The judgment will have been finished and will simply be an admission of truth that is, that is, 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 is as it were, almost forced from our lips by the very truth of it all. And we can't avoid it and we'll be lost. But we need not be lost because Jesus has gained the victory for us. He's overcome every enemy and he has done this, friends, so that believers have victory through Christ. And that brings us to the second point. And again, the same victories, the same victories over all the things that we saw Jesus have, we may have as believers over sin and temptation, over the world, the devil, death, and every enemy. And let's see what the scripture says first about the victory that we may have over sin and temptation. Amen? In Romans chapter 6, Romans is uh, about the fifth, see, fifth, sixth book of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, then Romans. And starting in verse 11, Paul has been speaking about Jesus. He's been speaking about his death to sin, how we may die to sin. And he says, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. Now that word reckon means to account, to believe it as if it's done. We are to reckon that ourselves are dead to what? Sin. But alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And he says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. And verse 14 is, is emphatically stated. It is an imperative statement. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law but under grace. Because it's the grace of God that can enable us to overcome every sin. Now, he speaks here about yielding ourselves as members of righteousness. Don't yield yourselves as members of unrighteousness. We might think of this word members here 
as being uh, an instrument, if you please, or a tool, a tool. I can take a tool, maybe it's a hammer, and I can use that hammer to drive a nail in the correct place, right? And I can use that hammer to take a chisel and chisel wood. I can pull nails with it. I can tap things into place. A lot of things you can do with a hammer. You know. But I could also take that hammer and knock a hole in the sheetrock in here. I could take a hammer and put a knot on your head with it. Right? Same hammer, though. Same hammer. So you may be tempted to think, well, you know, I don't have much to offer God. There's not much talent in me. God doesn't need your talent. He just needs you. Because, you see, it's not the instrument that's important. It's the workman that's important. It's the craft, pers craft person that's important. My daughter likes to play violin, son. And she's got two or three violins, and none of them are Stradivariuses by any means. But I tell you, if you give that violin to a virtuosus, that person will make it sound beautiful, even though it's a fairly inexpensive violin. They'll make it sound beautiful. We have a fairly cheap piano here. Nothing great. But I tell you, you let the right person come in and play this piano, it's going to sound beautiful. Because it's the person that counts, not the tool. The person, the workman, that counts. And God wants us to, 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 to yield ourselves. To yield simply means to submit to allow God to take control of us. And if we will let God take control with us, it doesn't matter what talents I have because I don't need any talent because he has the talent. And he will enable me to do what he wants and is able to do. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13, Paul says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man, but God is faithful. And I think that is the key point of this verse. God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. And so Paul says that we can indeed overcome all temptations through the power of Christ because God is faithful. He will keep us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 and 25, if we could turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 and 25. He says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain, and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. Now the reason I brought this text in because this text applies across the board in a lot of these things. In fact, if we go back, when we look at these subpoints, these subpoints, believers have victory through Christ over sin, temptation, the world, the devil, death, over every enemy. Really, a lot of those are very overlapping, aren't they? They're very overlapping. And so, what we just sort of have subdivided them to 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 expand and show the nuances in what it means to have victory through Christ. But the reason that I've brought this text in is because it helps us to understand that this victory, although it's a victory he wants to give us, is a victory that we have to surrender to, we have to submit to, and we have to cooperate with him in his plan. He says that if, we, that if we're going to be a part of this, that we must strive for the mastery, and we must be temperate in all things. We want to have the victory, we have to be temperate in all things. If I, know I'm, I'm, I, if I know I'm involved in a habit that is destroying my health, that's not being temperate in all things, you see. God wants me to stop that. I have a, a few paragraphs I'd like to share with you. And uh, this is from Christian Temperance and Bible Hygiene. Page 25, paragraph 2. Here are the good results of self-control and temperate habits are set forth. Making reference to these texts that we're just looking at here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. The various games instituted among the ancient Greeks in honor of their gods are presented before us by the Apostle Paul to illustrate the spiritual warfare and its reward. Those who were to participate in these games were trained by the most severe discipline. 
Every indulgence that would intend to weaken the physical powers was forbidden. Luxurious food and wine were prohibited in order to promote physical vigor, fortitude, and firmness. Continuing. To win the prize for which they strove. A chaplet of perishable flowers, bestowed amid the applause of the multitude, was considered the highest honor. Let me just pause there. Do you, do you get what, you, what was said? Do you know what, what it meant? In other words, they, they would go through all this hardship. They would endure hardness as a soldier, just like Paul says to Timothy. And they would, they would go through this regiment, perhaps for months preparing. And they'd run this one race that may last only minutes. And what do they get? They get a little laurel crown. It's going to fade away. They hear the applause of the people that fade away. And they do it all to get that. She goes on to say, If so much could be endured, so much self-denial practiced, in the hope of gaining so worthless a prize, so worthless a prize, which only one at best could obtain, how much greater should be the sacrifice, how much more willing the self-denial for an incorruptible crown and for everlasting life? And I ask you that question myself, beloved. What is heaven worth? Isn't heaven cheap enough? No matter what self-denial, no matter what sacrifices we must make to obtain a crown that will never be corruptible to a life of immortality. And then this last paragraph from page 25, all these paragraphs are from page 25, uh, paragraphs 2, 3, and 4 of page 25. There's a work for us to do, stern, earnest work. All our habits, tastes, and inclinations must be educated in harmony with the laws of life and health. By this means, we may secure the very best physical conditions and have mental clearness to discern between the evil and the good. Because I want to remind you, beloved, the track of truth and the track of error lie close together. And to the undiscerning eye, not worked by the Holy Spirit, they may appear as one. And we need to be able to discern between the evil and the good. We do. We as Christians are to overcome every sin and temptation, and in doing so, we also overcome the world. In 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5, it says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? Now, Friends, this is just so plain. This is so clear to us. If we want to have victory over the world, we must be born again. We must be born again. Jesus said in John chapter 3 and verse 3, He says, Ye must be born again. He didn't leave it as an option. If we want to be saved, we must be born again, receive Him into our lives. But it says that the ones who overcome the world are those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And when the Bible says Jesus is the Son of God, it means exactly that. It doesn't mean some symbolic connotation or role-playing that so many of the theologians put upon it today. And so I say to you, friends, if we want to be an overcomer, I don't have time to listen to people who deny that Jesus is the Son of God. I don't have that kind of time. In John chapter 15 and verse 19, John chapter 15 and verse 19, Jesus said, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Jesus says, yes, you are in the world, but you are not of the world. I remember several years ago, one of the people in this community, um, they, their house burned down. And so as a church, we wanted to help. And we got a donation together, and Brother Glenn Ford and I went to this place to give the donation to the person, and I was quite, quite glad to get it. But he remarked about how, how many people had been helping him. Well, this particular person, though he was in our community, uh, how shall I say this kindly? Uh, he, he maybe didn't have the greatest reputation in certain respects. But I remember Glenn telling me afterwards, um, he said, you know, he says, the world loves its own. 
The world loves its own. The people of the world were glad to help him because he was of them. But we're not to be of the world. We certainly need to help the world. We're here to be the light of the world. We're the salt of the earth. But we're not to be of the world. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, the Apostle Peter says, According as his divine power, his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lusts. And in fact, in both verse 3 and 4, as we learned in our Sabbath school class, the word divine there comes from the same Greek word that is elsewhere translated in the New Testament as Godhead. Sometimes we hear the word Godhead and we think what well, means something about a hierarchy of how this Godhead, whether it's Father, Son, Holy Spirit, or Father, Son, you know, who's on the head, who's at the top. But it doesn't mean that at all. It's, 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 it's an old English word that really doesn't relate to that at all. The, the Greek word simply means divine or that which is deity. And that same word is translated here, divine power and divine nature, in these two verses. We, as believers in Christ, are to have victory over the devil. In Revelation chapter 12, and if you haven't read Revelation recently, I'd encourage you to read it. It's a good book. A lot of important things in it. John says, I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him. How? By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Here's a group of people, and they overcame him. They overcame the devil. They overcame the one that was fighting against the Lamb. They overcame the one that was cast out of heaven. How did they do this? by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And even if it meant that they must be killed, because they loved not their lives, some of them, even to the death. To the death. In fact, the, the, the word in the New Testament that we translate martyr, it simply means witness. Witness. In those days, if you witnessed enough, many times you would be martyred. In Romans chapter 16 and verse 20, And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. You know, friends, we're no match for the devil. That's true. We're no match for the devil at all. God will bruise Satan under our feet, though. How do I know that? How can I believe that? How can I possibly teach such a thing? Because, friends, the Word of God, the Word of God, it says it. It's right here. Romans 16, 20. And I like this text, one of my favorite texts, 1 John chapter 4, 4. Year of God, little children, and hath overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So it's not that we have the power to overcome Satan, but when we have Christ living in us, then there's all the power and more needed because we have a, we have a finite foe a limited, finite foe, but we have an infinite source of power in God. We also, like Christ, now will have victory over death. I think of the story of Lazarus and Mary and Martha, his sisters, and Lazarus had died. And Jesus delayed going. He delayed going to care for his friend. And Martha, she was sad, as, as of course you would, would have to be and could only be in a time like that. You know, the Bible doesn't expect his friends to always be joyful and, and happy when tragedies happen. The Bible says to weep with those who weep. There's a place to rejoice with those who rejoice and a place to weep with those who weep. And Martha was weeping that day. But Jesus wanted to help her. Jesus wanted to help her. And, and he said unto her, in John 11, verses 25 and 26. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die, believest thou this. 
My question for you today is the same question Jesus asked Mary. Do you believe this? Because Jesus is the resurrection life, we will have a resurrection in life. Every one of us can think of someone important who's waiting on Jesus to come in the grave right now. I have two sons. I have Daniel and Hans. I'm waiting to see again. Longing to hold in my arms again. And I want to tell you, friends, I have no doubt. I have not the slightest sliver of indecision about whether this will happen or not because I have no doubt about who Jesus Christ is. And I have no doubt about his authenticity and his truthfulness. And when he says he is the resurrection life, then that is exactly what he means. And we are to have victory over every one of our enemies. Just quickly in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14, Paul says, Now thanks be unto God which always, always, always causes us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. We always triumph in every place. How can you do better than that, friends? What a blessing it is. We are to share in the victory of Jesus Christ. We are to share in this victory. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 37, Paul says, nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him. Through him. But as he says in chapter 6 and verse 5, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. But there's a condition here, isn't there? There's a condition. We must be planted together with Christ. All of these things that we're talking about, all these promises of the victory over temptation, sin, the devil, death, all these things, friends, it's only, only if we are in Christ. Only if we are putting our life in His. And you know, we, we, we are told by the Apostle Paul to examine ourselves to see whether we be of the faith or not. And honestly, you know, there are certain things we can do, beloved, as Christians to take our spiritual temperature, if you please. You know, they make all these gadgets today. I have one of these Apple Watches, and it tells me a hundred different things. But, you know, it doesn't tell me my temperature. You'd think it would, but it doesn't tell me my temperature. <laughs> tell me what my blood oxygen rate is, but it won't tell me my temperature. <laughs> but we can take our spiritual temperature, you know. Do we read our Bible like we used to when we first became a Christian? You know, when we first had that first ardent zeal for the Lord, or, you know, have we let things slack and slide off? Do we pray like we used to pray? Or more? Do we make it a point to be at the services of God that we used to be at that maybe we just don't get to anymore? Are we as concerned about sharing with our neighbor like we used to be? You know? Or do we just let things pass by anymore? We can sort of begin to take our temperature, beloved, you know, do I find myself cheating in, in the ways I treat my body? Do I find myself perhaps becoming angry and, and, and saying things I wouldn't have said before? We need to know whether we are in the faith or not. But if we are, according to Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And God wants, friends, to give us the final victory. He wants us to have the final victory. He really does. In the book of Revelation, in chapter 3, he tells us, He that overcometh, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 5, He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in what? White raiment. You know, when I was a kid, maybe when you were a kid too, depending on how old some of you are, and I wouldn't recommend this today, but we used to watch these westerns. Remember Lone Ranger, stuff like that? And there was always a one way to determine who were the good guys and who were the bad guys. The, white, the, the guys who had white hats were the good guys, and the guys who had black hats were always the bad guys. I mean, it, just, it was that way in the old westerns. It says here we're to have white raiment. White, a symbol of purity and cleanliness. 
and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 7. He that overcometh, the same shall inherit, what? All things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. And I think that's the greatest of all the promises, maybe. I mean, not just simply because we inherit all things, but he is our God. And he takes us as his sons and daughters. Now, it's true that all this isn't fully realized yet. We still live in a world of sin. We still have temptations that we must overcome. We still have the world that we must overcome. We must overcome the devil. We still have to overcome death. We still have enemies to overcome. But although it's not finished, the certainty, the certainty is fixed and sure if we are in Christ. In Philippians chapter 3, in verses 20 and 21, Paul says, For our conversation is in heaven. Now let me just stop there. This word conversation in the King James Bible is from a Greek word, politima, politima. And it goes back about three different variations to the actual root word, and it's the root word for city, city. And from that you get citizen. And we get our word politics from this word. You know, the place we live, our citizenship, our government, our politics, all of this. Well, we're only a couple, three weeks from the election here of the, of the United States president, our Senate, and our Congress, and all these important things. And people are really concerned about it. But as Christians, friends, that's not where our battle is. It's because it's not where our citizenship is. Paul says we are ambassadors for Christ. We're not ambassadors for Donald Trump. We're not ambassadors for Joe Biden or anyone else. We're ambassadors for Christ. And our citizenship, as one translation says, is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. And I'm so glad that it says all things because it gives me hope. It means it means me too. He can subdue me to him if I will just simply surrender my life to Jesus Christ. And that's what he asks us to. The Bible is full of, of, of decision questions. You know, choose you this day whom you will serve. Choose. Make a choice. The Bible tells us to choose. And if we will make the choice to start on the road, then Jesus will help us because he is not only the author of our faith, but it says he is the finisher of our faith as well. And so I want to encourage you today that if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, that you bow before him and ask him to forgive you of your sins and to make you his child and to bring you into his kingdom. And friends, he wants to do that and he will. And if you've been following Jesus, but you know, you, you're, you're thinking about the words that I just said a little bit ago about examining ourselves and you realize, you know, hey, this isn't like it used to be and this isn't like it used to be and I'm not doing this like I used to. And you realize that your experience has waned and you may be moving away and friends, it's time to get back. It's time to get back. In Selected Messages, Book 1, page 202 in paragraph 2, Ellen White is talking about the, the book, The Living Temple, that Dr. John Harvey Kellogg of the famous Kellogg's at Battle Creek wrote. And it was a book about health, but it was also a book that involved a lot of mysticism in it about God. And while the book may have been 99% good, you know, I mean, all this good health, hygiene, diet, all good, there was parts of it that, that were very bad. We need not the mysticism that is in this book. Those who entertain these sophistries, these sophistries, remember we were talking about the wiles of the devil earlier? These sophistries will soon find themselves in a position where the enemy can talk with them and lead them away from God. And so, beloved, we need truth. And we may think, you know, uh, what I'm reading here, what I'm listening to, this preacher on YouTube, I really like to hear him because, man, I mean, he blasts the papacy hard, <laughs> you know, or whatever. He gives us all the current news on it that we need. But here she's talking about a book 
that was clearly the great, great majority of it truth and good things. But there were woven into it these little sophistries of Satan. And she says that if we entertain these kind of sophistries, that we will be in a position where the enemy can talk with us, you know, speak to our minds or whatever, and can lead us away from God. It is represented to me that the writer of this book is on a false track. He has lost sight of the distinguishing truths for this time. He knows not whether his steps are tending, and many don't. The track of truth lies close beside the track of error, and both tracks may seem to be one to minds which are not worked by the Holy Spirit, and which therefore are not quick to discern the difference between truth and error. Error. Selected Messages, Book 1, page 202, paragraph 2. So it's my prayer, friends, that we will, we will apply ourselves and not allow the sophistries, the wiles of, of, of the devil to, to capture us because God, through Christ, has given us the victory over all these things. But friends, we must be a discerner of truth and error. And when we imbib in sophistries and things that we know are not right, but we say, well, but most of it's good. Most of it's right. We are putting ourselves in a very dangerous position. May God help us, friends. May God give us the victory over every temptation and sin because it's happened through Christ. May God give us victory over the world and the devil and all of these things that we've been talking about today. He wants to do it. He'll do it if you surrender yourself to Christ. And may God bless you lots and lots and lots. Mm -hmm.